good evening, everybody. Um, didn't quite expect to be doing this tonight. So many of you will have heard that it was moved. Um, to, to bring you up to speed, I got a call yesterday from Luke. Um, six minutes was all he was on the phone when he was hustled away. Uh, and he told me that they, they were putting something against him for unlawful use of uh, prison communication devices. Now, you remember that they went after him the day before looking for an illicit communication device. Clearly didn't find one. So just switched it and said, right, OK, it was it was not an illicit communication device. You used the legitimate devices illicitly. So that was what they put against him. Uh, and then he was gone. So I immediately started making phone calls, contacting people. Mike O'Brien in Wales, thank you. What a godsend. Contacted Mike. I was like, I need your help. What do we do? He sent me examples of cases where people protesting their instant, innocence from prison are allowed contact, phone contact with the media. And these cases go all the, back, all the way back to 2002 until the latest one today. The High Court today still agreed that prisoners are doing nothing wrong by speaking to um, media to highlight matters of prisons and prisons and injustice. So he's done nothing wrong. I sent that stuff to Luke immediately. And I got a call this morning um, to inform me that his his lawyer had tried to make an appointment to see him this morning and had been told that he wasn't there. But they wouldn't tell him where he was. Um, you can imagine what that felt like. Um, just trying to trying to find ways around it, things things that we could do to help. And then came another phone call that said, um, you do realise that if he's used the prison phones unlawfully, then you could they could come after you for publishing the content of those calls unlawfully. And like, what are the chances? And then I realised it's Friday. And I thought, well, <laughs> did I take the risk? Friday afternoon? I think not. So I basically chucked everything in my vehicle and left. Um, but I've got somebody watching the house. So if anybody out there has got any ideas, there are people watching the house. Um, but I just, it, it wasn't worth taking the risk. So then I started getting messages. Before I left, I started getting messages from lots of people. Luke had managed to have a list of people with emails ready. And he fired them out to everybody. And thank you, every last one of you, for firing the messages over to me. Because, because Luke had no way of knowing who his communications would get through to. So the latest that we know is that he's been moved two shots back to secure conditions. Um, they have blocked him from all telephone contact, everything. But one of the things they did was when, when they served him with the, the bit paper that said that this is what the problem was, was this using the phones and everything. Luke refused to sign it because he explained to them, he said, I've done nothing wrong. Now, remember, when I sent that stuff, I sent it through the prison email service. They could have seen the number of cases where it's been ruled in the prisoner's favour over and over and over again. It was on their email system this morning. Did it make a difference? Did it help? Um, they, they brought this thing for Luke to sign and he said, no, they refused to sign it. Now, what's supposed to happen there is because he refused to sign it, another officer is supposed to come in and witness the fact that Luke refused to sign it. Well, you don't need me to tell you. There was no other. There was no other officer brought in. But the officer that that brought this against Luke, when Luke said to him, "I've done nothing wrong. The law allows me to do this," this officer said, "I don't care. I don't care what the law says. This is what we're doing." I don't care what the law says. Luke's message to 
But all of these different people was very clear about one thing. Put everything out. Hold nothing back. So that's why I'm doing this. It's why I did the one earlier. Um, I wanted to, to give a better explanation. I was in a bit of a rush earlier. Let's be let's be honest about it. Um, so so essentially, the this and you have to understand this is nothing to do with the failed drug test because of the pressure he was under that they used as the excuse to take him over to the the um, higher security unit in Greenock. Nothing to do with it. So it's starting to look like that was a ruse as well. He was going back to shots the minute those videos came out. Now, a lot of people have said, why did you put them out, Sandra? You must have known this would happen. Yeah? I guessed it would. But so did Luke. It was Luke's decision for those videos to go out. He said, the more I stay silent, the more it protects them. And we talk at length about the potential consequences of putting those videos out. And um, it, he was resolute. He was resolute. No. If we say nothing, they're just going to keep doing it. It's just going to get worse. Now, I'd like to go to the, the Daily Record <laughs> article for want of a better way of describing it. I, the, the open letter that I put out today, I sent to the, one of the journalists, if you can call them that, from the Daily Record, to say, why did you lie? Why did you say he was removed from community access because he took drugs? That is a complete and utter misrepresentation. He took something to help him sleep because of the torture that they were putting him through. But of course, our old friends, the hacks, flip it around and tell an outright lie. They moved them because. No, they didn't. They'd removed them from community access, access mm, nine, ten months before that. And he still, they wasted two years of his four year window. Buggering about, forgive the language, but that's what they were doing. Um, the, the, the other thing that they said in this article was that he was getting three years extra on his sentence because of the drugs. That is so untrue. I don't even have words for it. What I said in both the, the template letter and to the journalist was they'd already wasted two years of his four year window. So basically, even if they started now, he'd still have that two years to do. But they also were failing to do these first grant uh, um, temporary release applications in the 12 to 16 weeks that they're supposed to do them. They were taking 18 months. So first, these two years that they did nothing with, they wasted on his behalf. And then the 18 months until the first grant was released. That was the three years we were talking about. And that rag i'm sorry you can't call it a newspaper for them to put out that he was getting an extra three years because of a failed drug test when he was getting a, an extra three years because of a failed system a totally rotten broken system that he had no control over so where we're at just now um Obviously, no phone contact, so I've got no way of speaking to him or finding out how he is or um, getting any updates from from that perspective. The emails, we take it so, so much for granted. We send an email, go ping, and the other person gets it the next second. Where Luke is, we send an email, they, they download them at certain points Craig will be with you in a minute. They download them at certain points uh, and then they're shuffled out to the, and then the prisoner has to hand out the response and then they're all taken back. You know, it can take a couple of days. In these circumstances, in 
the 21st century. That's outrageous. That is to disappear a prisoner like that, who's 10 months from his parole date and never put a foot wrong, not once in 18 years. They've, they've got to look at themselves. They have got to look at themselves. They're doing this on our behalf. They're doing this because they think we agree with that. And I said to these journalists today, yeah, he's, he's 10 months from, or he should have been 10 months from freedom. He's paid whatever Jews society leveled on him. Why are you continuing to demonize him? What more do you want? Yeah, strangely enough, I didn't get any response. So that's where we are right now. Um, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't tell you any more, but I can imagine how Luke is. I think we can all imagine how he is right now. Um, but I can't even tell you if or when his solicitors will get in to see him. If or when he'll be able to directly communicate with anybody. What um, consequence this will have on his parole date? Nothing. And we have to remember, he has done nothing wrong. By making those phone calls and agreeing to them to be um, recorded and published, he did nothing wrong. And here's something else, and it's really important. If he was doing something wrong by having these conversations, having them recorded, knowing they were going to be published, why didn't they come after him after the documentary? because he spoke in the documentary. Why haven't they come after him any of the other times that he's spoken out and it's been put out on social media? Could it be because this time he called them out? He told us exactly what they're doing to him, exactly how they're torturing him. And rather, rather than be human, and look at it and go, God, because he, he told you himself about how, you know, one person say, oh, the next person will do something about it. I can't do it. Not my job. So, so that's fine. You, you get that. They're passing it for pillar to post. It's not fine. But you know what I mean? That that, as I said, by standard um, syndrome, where they just think somebody else is going to do something about it. That's one thing. But when he put that out in its entirety and showed how they're all complicit and how they're all backing each other up rather than be human, rather than look at that and go, Ugh, we've all paid, played a part in that. They went straight for, get rid of him, stop him speaking, stop him putting this stuff out, because it exposes us. Well, you're damn right it does. That was the intention. So, um, we, we, just, we just need to keep going now. We just need to keep going, keep the pressure up. Um, we'll, we'll get these protests organised. <laughs> Might be a bit more difficult this weekend than originally intended. Um, we'll, we'll get these protests organised. He needs you people. He needs every one of you. And the lady that said the other day, maybe us behind him's not enough. Maybe we need to go in front of him. Now, I think, is the time we have to go in front of him. So I'll keep you posted when I can, when I can get on, when I hear anything. Um, somebody asked there what's happening with the forensics. We will update you as soon as we've got something that we can update you with. Remember, a lot of the stuff we have to keep behind the scenes until it's we're able to put it out. Um, the, one of the other things that I, I did ask the journalists today, and I know some of them will be watching this so that they can twist it for their own ends. So I'm just going to ask this question again. If the evidence proves, this forensic evidence, Luke Mitchell has been innocent all along, how will you live with yourselves for what you've done, all of you, for 20 years? Because that day's coming. That day is not far away at all. And every one of you who's demonized them and tortured them and abused them, 
then you'll know you did that to an innocent child. I hope you can sleep at night. So I'm going to go now. Um, I don't have a great deal of power and I might run out fairly soon. Um, I'll be back when I can be. And thank you, everybody, from Luke, for everything you're doing. We need you now. All right. Enjoy the rest of your Friday evening. I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye.